May we all have the strength and courage to do just that. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Karen. And now we uh, have a surprise. We have no pianist, unless anybody here can play the piano, we will sing the national anthem a cappella. <laughs> So proudly we hail at the twilight's last gleaming, who for stripes and bright stars through the carol clubs fire, o'er the ramparts we watch, for so gallantly streaming, and the rocket's red glare. The long birds sing in air, they through the night, that our flag was silver. Oh, save us that star spangled and heard and Play ball. Thank you, everybody. Improvise, adapt, and overcome. And now we will recite the four-way test, um, which is guides the things we think, say, and do. One, is it the truth? Two, is it fair to all concerned? Three, will it build goodwill and better friendships? Four, will be beneficial to all concerned. And now we welcome to the stage Dr. Joe Michaels, Managing Principal, Solomon Bruce Consulting, to welcome our visiting Rotarians and guests. Thank you, Madam President. We're very fortunate to have many visiting Rotarians and guests with us today. Chris Nettles is here, with, uh, sponsored by Jim Austin. Chris, where are you? Chris Smith is here with uh, Kathy Sheffield as uh, the sponsor. Chris. Crystal Galvan is here with Rebecca Montgomery. Uh, Crystal Galvan is with Jim Austin as well. We're glad Crystal's here. Uh, Dexter Hickman, a rotor actor who's the vice president of operations at Jim Austin Company, is with us. Uh, Dexter is one of our young uh, rotor actors. If you haven't met him and all the other rotor actors, you need to do that. Dexter, where are you? All right, good. Donna James Harvey is here with, uh, sponsored by Courtney Lewis. Donna James. Glenn Schaller is here with uh, Greg Carter. John Avila is here with Bob Mitchell. John. Justin Tabor is here with Jim Austin. Justin. Mackenzie Carolan, the Vice President at Lindbeck, is here with Shanna Saldana. Our mayor, Maddie Parker, is here as a guest to Courtney Lewis. Mayor. Uh, Alimni Juco from a guest of William Johnson. Alimni. Steve Montgomery is here with Rebecca Montgomery. Steve. Sutton Cole got to come with uh, Jeff Postel. Sutton. Will Northern, the managing broker at Northern Crane Realty, is here with uh, John Lognesclatter. Will? Jim Weefholder is a guest of John Lotta. Thank you, Jim. Kendall Locke is a guest of Courtney Lewis. Kendall? And Derek Buchanan is a guest of Frank Shields. 
Madam President, we're very fortunate to have a visiting Rotarian today. Dave Johnson is with us from the Cross Timbers Rotary Club. Dave? Madam President, those are all of our visiting Rotarians and guests. Thank you, Dr. Michaels. And now for the moment some of you have been waiting for, I welcome to the stage Kathy Sheffield, Chief Development Officer, Lena Pope Home, to give our newscast. Thank you. I love you too, Michelle. So happy Friday the 13th a day when irrational superstitions haunt people. I don't know about you, I'm not superstitious, I'm just stitious. But if you are superstitious, you may not wanna to fly today. According to the TSA, passenger air flight violence is still on the rise. This week it was reported that flight attendants and air marshals are starting to take personal defense classes to prepare for in-flight fights. Say that three times fast. These are not your ordinary personal defense classes. These classes are being taught by MMA fighters. For those of you who may not know, MMA is mixed martial arts, sometimes referred to as cage fighting. It's a no holds barred, ultimate fighting, full contact combat sport based on striking, grappling, and ground fighting. And you're probably wondering what's gonna make this story funny. It's not gonna be the punchline. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Dallas County uh, joins a handful of Texas counties in suing Texas Governor Greg Abbott over the mask mandate and election rules. In fact, the list of counties and school districts suing the governor over the mandate grows daily. In response to Governor Abbott's um, situation, he has hired a team of MMA fighters to train him for his upcoming legal battles. Let's see what I did there. Okay, speaking of masks, Many school-aged children this week had the return of school, going back to school. Parents need to know that the Fort Worth ISD has recently began imposing a mask mandate. Colorful themed logoed masks are very popular, kind of like these. Um, however, you do not want to put your children in a Dallas Cowboys mask because the CDC has concluded they provide absolutely no defense. <laughs> You can't say the Texas House Democrats accomplished nothing by fleeing to Washington, D.C. They left Austin with one case of Miller Lite, but while they've been in our nation's capital, they've picked up six cases of Corona. <laughs> Speaking of our road tripping Texas legislatures, did you hear that they finally decided to come back home? It wasn't the public shaming or even the sergeant in arms arrest warrants that brought them home. It was Bud Kennedy's article on the increased use of meat substitutes at local Texas ranger, or Texas restaurants. I don't know if you read, read that or not, but they talked about the eliminating, sadly, the eliminating role of cows in the Texas food change. Food change. So why are the Texas Democrats coming home? Well, even Texas Democrats like beef on their burgers. Thank you. And finally, the highly anticipated Field of Dreams game between the New York Yankees and the Chicago White Sox saw Kevin Costner make an emotional return to that filming location, followed by a very cool virtual visual, excuse me, of the players entering the field on an Iowa cornfield, just like in the movie. It was a nail biter of a game. If you didn't watch it, the Yankees hit two run homers with two outs, and, and that was in the top of the ninth to take the lead. And then the Sox rally with a two-run homer in the bottom of the ninth. That was tremendous. I don't know about you, but I'm hoping that the next baseball movie remake is going to be Major League. Thank you. This week's weather, I should have swapped those around. This week's weather is going to continue to be hot and muggy with a chance of scattered thunderstorms this weekend. So please stay safe, stay healthy, and stay cool. Thank you, Kathy. And, and so today we are gonna, we're going back to school as we start a new series called Rotary Rewind, where we learn a little bit about our club's history. So here is Professor Past President J.R. Labby to give us a history lesson. Yeah, that's about what it's worth. Um. 
the prop was from Aurora. So, um, at the request of President Courtney and the Board of Directors, we are going to begin an occasional series about our club's history, some of which you might know, some of the facts you might not be aware of. So recognizing a visiting Rotarian who travels the farthest to attend a meeting at our club has long been a tradition here. And in the early days, our club presidents handed out fountain pens and cigarette lighters, right? So in July of 1963, the youngest Rotary president ever elected in the club's first 50 years took the helm with what he called an adventuresome idea. 32-year-old Frank Dunham Jr. asked the board and it approved giving a single yellow rose to the long distance Rotarian. If you are not familiar with the saga of the Yellow Rose of Texas, first for shame, Second, Google Emily Morgan and Yellow Rose for the courageous and salacious details. The Yellow Rose ceremony entailed asking a club member to bring his daughter, a niece, his secretary to the meeting, and she would present the said rose with a peck on the cheek of the visitor. Cue the manly giggles, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. So if we were doing it today, actually, Eric Fox would get the yellow rose because he hasn't been here in like 40 years and probably remembers the tradition. Uh, the first yellow rose girl was Rotarian Mickey Goldman's daughter. And for the rest of Mickey's natural life, he provided the flower each week. At his passing, Gordon Boswell and Felix Ankeley provided the posies, which continues today in a form because we still get our flower arrangement every week from Gordon Boswell. It is no coincidence that the tradition was forever buried during Club President Kenneth Barr's term in 1987 and 88. That was the year the US Supreme Court ruled against Rotary International after R.I. terminated the Duarte California Rotary Club's charter for admitting two women to active membership. Barr wrote of this change in the guard in our, ninth, in our 75th anniversary book, and I quote, now that feminine member, members are a reality, we in the Rotary Club of Fort Worth must make this into a true asset in the ongoing programs of our club. Women will have new ideas. Women will occupy new classifications. The women who will be members in our club will be real leaders, and they will take on their new responsibilities with a vigor that we men have sometimes found wanting. Bless his heart. He had no idea what was coming. Rotarian and auto dealer Jack Williams stepped up in 1988 to offer our gold-plated golf putter for our club's long-distance gift, and his son, U.S. Representative Roger Williams, has continued his father's largesse. But for a brief time during COVID, our members have been shouting, say yes, for more than 30 years when the long-distance Rotarian is asked by the president, do you play golf? As for electing the youngest president in club history, when Dunham's passing the presidential pin ceremony, ceremony happened to Wallace Graves, one member in the audience was heard saying, we'll never make that mistake again. And that's Rotary Rewind. Thank you. We're, we're glad women are now welcome in Rotary. Uh, and now we welcome to the stage Elliot Goldman, founder, GL2 Partners, for a Czech presentation. So we've got a great organization and we're presenting a Czech uh, tonight, today too. This is the first check of the year that's being given out. And I like to try to remember uh, Kenneth Baum, who gave a substantial grant to the Rotary Endowment. And the first check of the year 
is given out in his honor because of the uh, contribution that he made to the Rotary Endowment. So we have South Mountain Vets US, and Michael Leisure's here to uh, accept the check. They help homeless veterans and the homeless, and we're providing infrastructure in the form of a trailer and sleeping bags for those who uh, are in need in our community. And so we're excited. It's about nine tenths of a Bitcoin, but don't convert it. Uh, you weren't here last week, but we did a Bitcoin thing. So anyway, so $4,000 uh, check to you guys, and uh, thank you for all the good work you're doing in the community. Thank you very much. And now for a new member introduction, we welcome Michelle Krim to the stage and Samantha. Okay, friends, I am very excited to have Samantha join us. Many of you remember her from earlier this year. She was the recipient, actually the first place winner of our first minority business competition. I met her about two years ago during the Fort Worth business plan competition. I knew her then by her nickname, Harley. And it was kind of funny during some of the emails earlier with Rotarians, I kept calling her Harley. And they're like, who the heck is Harley? Well, it's Samantha. So she also runs a nonprofit along with her business. So I want you guys to join me in a Snoopy happy dance to welcome Samantha to our club. Hi, I'm so grateful for the opportunity to join the club today. Um, an interesting fact about me, when I was 15 years old, our family home was struck by lightning and we were homeless in under 15 minutes. I quit school, got a full-time job to help support my family. I fast forward a few years later, I met a gentleman that said, you should be an engineer, you really have a mind for it. Um, because of his belief in me and his mentorship, it changed the trajectory of my life. And now not only do I own a civil engineering firm, I've founded a nonprofit where I hope to help change the trajectory of other opportunity challenge individuals' lives. I'm also an ordained minister and love to perform wedding ceremonies because I can talk about love all day long. <laughs> well done. Thank you. Thank you. And now we welcome to the stage our chairman of the day, William Johnson, Director of Transportation and Public Works, City of Fort Worth, to introduce our program. Thank you, President Courtney. Good afternoon. Our speaker today is a man who does not need an introduction. He's a transformational leader who has created positive change in residential and business communities, in transportation, logistics, and technology, and our quality of life for generations to come. Mike Berry began his real estate career in North Texas in 1982. <laughs> 1882. <laughs> um, and he's been involved in real estate development projects for over 38 years. He joined Hillwood in 1988 and helped pioneer the transformation of the Alliance Airport from an industrial airport to what we now call the Alliance Corridor, which is a 27,000 acre thriving master plan community uh, that deals with commercial and industrial development with technology and a whole host of residential activity. It accounts for over $92 billion in economic value to our communities. Mike heads the Hillwood Urban Group and has led similar regional transformational developments in Frisco, Dallas, Fort Worth, and other parts of the region. Mike's imprint on North Texas landscape has earned him numerous honors throughout his career, including his induction into the North Texas Commercial Real Estate Hall of Fame in 2013, and his receiving the Golden Deeds Award in 2016. <clears throat> North Texas looks to Mike, all of North Texas looks to Mike 
and Hillwood for as a resource and as leaders. But here in Fort Worth, we have the honor of saying that he lives and resides right here in Fort Worth uh, with his wife and his children. With no further ado, I would like to introduce Mr. Mike Berry. William, thank you very much. That was a very nice introduction. And I look around the room and not feel like I know, and I do know, probably 80% of the, the folks here. Mayor Parker, I'm honored that you would take time out of your schedule to, to be here today. You, you could probably come give this presentation. Uh, Eric Fox, thank you for coming out of Rotarian retirement. <laughs> you could also probably give this presentation. Um, but anyway, thank you for the invitation to be here. I, I haven't, I know years ago, Ross Pro Senior spoke to the Rotary Club of downtown Fort Worth when we first announced Alliance. And then Ross Jr. has spoken over the years and I've actually had the pleasure of, of speaking. So uh, this is a return visit, but hopefully I'll give you some updated news and, and information about things going on. I'm gonna spend the first part of the presentation just bringing you up to date on the things that are happening in the core Alliance development and some of the new projects that we're working on. But emphasis will be towards the end on the things we're doing now in mobility innovation and um, the, the exciting opportunities that exist really for Fort Worth and, and the whole region in terms of being a leader uh, in the future of mobility innovation. So I'll spend a lot of time talking about that because I think we've got a platform here uh, that can position us to, to truly be the, the center of North America for advancement of, of these new technologies. Um, just historically, uh, William mentioned uh, the start of Alliance Airport. That was actually, we broke ground on the airport July 9th, 1988. Uh, and were it not for the vision and leadership of those two men, particularly Ross Pro Sr., who's no longer with us, um, Ross Jr. and I wouldn't be here without him because the land, we would not have been able to assemble the, the scale and scope of the land that we've been able to work with now for, for over 30 years. So uh, it was really his vision, but more so Ross Jr.'s vision to take this opportunity to develop an airport and turn it into uh, what is now really the catalyst for, for a 27,000 acre uh, economic engine for, for North Texas. And, I promise you, none of us on our team envisioned at that time what Alliance could become and the, the diversity of uses and, and opportunities that came our way. We, we thought we were just building an airport, um, but he, Mr. Perot would drive us to think outside the box back in those early days. He would really press us, and I think that's, that has a lot to do with, with how we've achieved uh, the things that we've been able to achieve. Hillwood as a, as a company grew from the roots of Alliance. So everything we're doing now at the, on the national level, uh, really we learned here at Alliance and we've just taken it and, and found ways to, to expand around the country. We've got a, a huge industrial platform now. We're in 27 different states. We're in three European countries, uh, but nothing, at the scale of Alliance. Alliance is still the, the legacy project for, for our company. We've also expanded in, into residential master plan development and it's been a huge growth opportunity for us. Once again, North Texas has been our, our core home. Um, and then from that, other real estate uh, uh, core lines of business have, have evolved. Uh, this, is, this is where we are today. So really starting from the development of Alliance Airport 33 years ago, we've now grown the entire uh, Hillwood platform to, to that, that scale. Uh, this is, William mentioned some of the uh, economic impact statistics. This is really the, the entire 27,000 acre platform of, of Alliance stretching all the way up and down Interstate 35W, almost to Denton. Uh, all the way down to the 287-35 split. So it's not 
You know, if you're familiar with the Irvine Ranch, say in Southern California, which is a huge 40 plus thousand acre development, it's one contiguous piece of land that was original ranch. This is really not. This is something that we have strung together over the years, but it gives us incredible opportunities to develop a wide variety of, of things and bring a lot of different uses to the table because we can create these pockets of development that fit different sorts of activities that we want to pursue. Um, our last big piece of development, which we're about to open up, is that big blue block on the north that's called Hunter Ranch. It's 3,500 acres, and it'll be the last big piece of at least what we own today um, that will be a, a large master plan development. But the core is really in that dark blue uh, piece in the center, uh, which is what I'll focus on. Uh, there are now 63,000 people working uh, at Alliance, uh, over 530 companies represented, many of those, and I'll show you a slide here in a minute that, that'll show you the, the brands of the, of the major companies that are there today. But um, I think that job number is the one we're most proud about. The 63,000 jobs, as you all know, fuels a huge amount of economic impact. Every one of those people not only has a job, but they become a taxpayer, they become a homeowner or an apartment renter, they, they buy groceries, they go to restaurants, and that multiplier, that churn of those dollars really does have a broad impact across the whole region. And, and we try to measure that uh, each and every year. We report to the city council every year on, on the economic impact of, of that program. There's also over 50 million square feet of real estate that's been built uh, on the ground out there. So it's a, it's a significant um, amount of, of space. Our roots are industrial. As I mentioned, we started with the airport and we really didn't know what we were doing. To be totally honest with you, nobody builds spec, speculative airports in this country. Um, and I really didn't know, I was the first employee uh, other than Ross. And, you know, he said, come on, just come and let's, to this airport and I didn't know anything. I'm not a pilot, didn't know anything about aviation. I knew some about real estate development because I'd been in the business prior to, uh, but it was really sort of throw it on the wall and see if it sticks. And what we learned pretty quickly is really the, the airport, although it wasn't the real driver for our initial decade of business development around Alliance, it was more like, it was an, the iconic flag. It was the thing that got people's attention and brought them to see. And what we, what we actually worked with was rail, highway, power, water, sewer. Those were really our, our strong um, uh, platform selling tools. The airport was really more of of the, the glamour side of it. But it really did allow us to build this idea of a truly integrated, international, global logistics hub, which didn't exist anywhere in the country at this, at this scale, where someone had brought together all of these big pieces of transportation. And so we kind of lucked into it. Our biggest partner um, that emerged as still one of our largest and most important clients is the Burlington Northern Santa Fe Railway. They, they now operate the number one largest inland port in the United States at Alliance. So we are, imagine we went out to, imagine going out to the ports of LA and Long Beach, carving out a big piece of the port and bringing it and dropping it right here in Fort Worth. That's, that's what we did. And once again, we, we couldn't even spell intermodal in 1991. Um, and we kind of just by thinking out of the box and, and following Mr. Perot's lead of being creative, we were able to create uh, this, this idea of putting the intermodal hub next to the airport and, and it really, that's, that's, what, that's what sent us in the, the direction we're in today. So I'm gonna quickly go through, I gotta watch my time, Courtney, because I get, I'm a, I'm a babbler. I get excited about this. I'm still having fun, thankfully. Um, so I'm going to walk through the, the big chunks of Alliance so you can see the, the different sorts of things that are happening there. This is the Alliance Gateway. It's on the eastern end of the, of the development. I'll just go back to the slide. You see it there on the right. That's at, at uh, State Highway 170 and 377. It's the 
far eastern edge of the city of Fort Worth. Fort Worth stops at that uh, at 377 there, and then you pick up Roanoke and Westlake. Um, so thankfully, the vision of Fort Worth's leadership back in the day, led by Bob Bowen at that time, we grabbed all that land. Um, people thought we were a little crazy, but we grabbed all that land, and it's it's now allowed us to to use the power of Fort Worth and its ability to build roads and water and sewer to, to drive that because we wouldn't have been able to do it if we were working at that time in Roanoke or Westlake. None of those cities didn't have the, the capability. So this is Gateway. Uh, I'll just point out one big thing on this site that is, is huge. That upside down L building there in the middle, that's Facebook's new data center. It's now one of the largest data centers in the world. Um, it comprises over $2 billion of investment. And for those of you who remember when they announced, it was just a few short years ago, they were gonna do about a third of what they ended up doing. They've now built out the entire site. And once again, it is, it's one of the largest in the world right there. Um, here's the airport Alliance Center, we call it. This is really where the, where the core of development, and, our, and, and I'm, I mentioned our aviation business wasn't much of a driver back then. Believe me, it is today. It's with, with all the explosion of e-commerce, logistics fulfillment, um, our big anchor customers at the airport, namely FedEx on one side of the airfield and now Amazon Air on the other side are driving huge, huge growth. Um, and, and they're adding, so Amazon, FedEx added 10 daily flights, six, well, three months ago, so the, the, the airport activity just blown up and they're adding an international flight uh, this fall uh, to go direct to Asia. So that's gonna be a huge open opener for us. Amazon on the left side, we built, we were fortunate to be selected by them to be the first ground up Amazon air freight hub in the country. So we had the chance to build for them from scratch their first hub, which was a challenge because they kept changing things along the way. but it's now the model for their whole air freight system. And they're running about 20 flights a day out of there and they're adding flights all the time. So it's, you know, what, it, what we thought would happen years ago in terms of Alliance being this big air freight hub um, is now, it's now really, really taken off. And then linking the airport to what you're looking at now, which is the west side of the airport, that big intermodal hub that I talked about that drives so much economic activity for the region is that big thing on the left of that photo. That's now the largest, uh, in terms of volume, the largest inland intermodal um, port uh, in the country. And it is uh, equivalent in terms of volume to the port of Houston. So imagine the port of Houston dropping into our backyard. That's the kind of volume we're doing in terms of container freight movements. And then as you move up to the north, just a couple of other areas, I, I, I point out one, you can't see it pick, it, pick the building out, but one of our more recent customers here, Stanley Black & Decker, they brought all of their manufacturing back from China and they picked Alliance as the place to, for this for Craftsman Tools, they picked Alliance as the place to locate that. So they just built and opened their brand new automated Craftsman 2.0 tool factory and it represented 300 jobs that had been offshored coming back to the U.S., which was a great, a great story. And and we're so we're trying to grab onto that and bring bring more, more of those types of users here. And then uh, last area, uh, just up by the speedway, you know, we bought this land like four years ago because we thought we were running out of land for industrial development. We started, we put a plan together, and we started building our first building, and and we're now built out. So it's gone. It's done fully leased, fully built overnight. Crazy. Um, here are, here people say, well, if, you, if you're if you making a sales call and you could only take one thing with you, what would you take? This would be the slide that I would take uh, because it really represents the scale, scope, quality, and diversity of the entire platform. Uh, we've been able to really put a story together to go recruit a comp companies from almost any industry. 
Uh, we're seeing huge growth right now in financial services. I know you all are probably watching what's going on in the financial services sector. We all thought COVID, you know, the markets would shut down. We were going back into 2008. Well, it's, it's exactly the opposite. I was with Charles Schwab yesterday at their new headquarters at Alliance, and they went from four trillion of assets under management to seven trillion of assets under management just in the last 30 months. Um, they've had they've hired 3,000 people here that have never been to the office, and they're still because of COVID. Um, and they're still processing, you know, huge volumes of, of trades every day. So it's pretty incredible what, what's going on out there just in that sector alone. And when they open up, and you all know that, that Charles Schwab is our title sponsor uh, for the Colonial Golf Tournament, thankfully. Um, but when they open up and are able to come back to work, uh, which they told me they just pushed out to January 1, um, you'll see a, a whole new ripple of that economic impact that I talk about because 6,000 people will end up on that campus and think about homes, restaurants, et cetera, et cetera, and traffic. We're trying to fix the traffic, William. We got 170 under construction. So anyway, there's, there's, I can't dwell on this slide too long, but there's a story there's a great story behind almost every one of those companies that we were able to bring here and everyone came for a different reason. Um, but now the power of that ecosystem that gets built around the, those companies is amazing. And that's what I'll talk about here with the Mobility Innovation Zone. I just wanna quickly cover the Circle T Ranch because it's a different part of Alliance. It's not the big industrial platform. It's really our corporate campus sort of headquarters potential um, beautiful open space uh, area. It's not in the city limits of Fort Worth, but it abuts, uh, as I mentioned earlier, it abuts the, the Fort Worth city limits there at 377. This is an aerial view. The Charles Schwab headquarters is that big campus in the, in the foreground of that aerial view. You're looking down 114 towards DFW airport. Um, and that's another advantage that we have, the proximity and connectivity to DFW Airport, as you all know, that's our, that is our, that's our strongest selling point uh, to almost any company that considers moving here. Um, and our ability to, to tie people right into it from that location is, is pretty unique. Um, we are working on a plan right now to develop a large regional park system. We've hired a, a, a world renowned park planner named Thomas Woltz, and he's designing uh, a huge park system for us that will run through the center or the, the western side of the Circle T, and that will create some opportunities to do some very unique corporate campus headquarter type sites. Um, and with what's going on right now, and you all are watching this as well, the, the, the in migration, particularly from the West Coast of companies who want to move into Texas uh, is pretty robust, probably more, more robust than I've, a per any period I've, I've ever seen. Um, and we feel like there's some opportunities for us to capture some of that business here and give companies a very unique sort of heavy green, heavy open. I mean, ESG, you all are reading about ESG. ESG is driving a lot of major corporate real estate decisions now. So you have to have, you've got to have an environmental story. Um, you really have to be attentive to sustainability. You have to be able to not just talk it, but you got to actually execute on it. So we're spending a lot of time now trying to make sure that we are schooled up and we're building into our platform a, a very um, real uh, sustain, sustainability uh, story. Um, two other major players at Circle T, Deloitte, Deloitte University uh, is right there in the center. If you haven't seen it, you got to go. Uh, it's, it's hard to get into because they're, hey, they're, they do, they open it up only for their associates, but it is truly a world-class learning center uh, that they use for 
uh, corporate leadership development, sales training across their whole network, but they're bringing in 50,000 people a year through Deloitte University from their network around the country. Um, and it's, it's a, it is the most popular facility and the most popular part of their employee experience. Everyone wants to come there. So fortunately for us, because it's so popular and because it's oversubscribed, they just acquired uh, that big green block of land to the uh, east of Deloitte University for some expansion plans, which I think will, will be really, really cool. And then Fidelity Investments, another major financial services company, they occupy 1.2 million square feet there on the right, and they employ 5,500 people on that campus. So if you take Charles Schwab, Fidelity, TD Ameritrade, who's across the street off the map, uh, who Charles Schwab just acquired, Mercedes-Benz Financial Services, who's over by the airport at Alliance. You start to add that whole story up, there are roughly 12,000 financial services workers in that, in that zone today, which is a very powerful driver for future activity and, and economic development. Um, so I'm gonna flip through these quickly. This is Schwab's campus I showed you. That's Deloitte in the top, Fidelity, uh, Schwab again. Um, we're building a golf course. We hired Gil Hance, who's a uh, world-renowned golf course architect. Um, we're doing building a par three that won't be a public course. It'll be more built into the environment of the Circle T Ranch. It'll be more for clients and, and customers, but uh, uh, it's, it's going to be very cool. Hopefully get it done this fall. Um, and then this, is, this just helps you understand sort of that park system and that open space environment we're trying to create. So now I'll talk about what I actually came here to talk about. Um, but you can't tell this story unless you, you know, level set. So um, we, and I'll try to condense this. Four years ago, we were approached by Uber Elevate. Uber Elevate was a division of Uber Technologies, uh, and it was Uber's effort to launch an urban air mobility platform, basically moving people in dense urban areas from one urban zone to another using what they call EV tolls, which are electric vertical takeoff and landing vehicles. Um, and th they felt that you know, given what they had built on the surface with their surface Uber network, that being able to help lead the development of an urban air mobility national and even global system uh, would only enhance mobility for decades ahead for all, for all people. Um, so they asked us to be their partner and help them study infrastructure needs. What does a vertiport look like? Where does it need to go? What sort of power? charging infrastructure do you have to bring to it, et cetera, et cetera. How do you coordinate with the FAA? How do we create an urban airspace corridor for all these? So we got involved at that level. The more we worked with them, the more we started coming back downstream and realizing that all of these technologies that are needed to, to fly these new vehicles through a new airspace system are all the same technologies that are being used by the um, autonomous vehicle people, the electric vehicle folks and the, and the, those that are moving autonomy, both people and freight. So long story short, we said, hmm, what a great platform Alliance could be to become kind of the test bed and the research center and the development center for all these technologies. We're already working with Walmart, Amazon, UPS, FedEx, BNSF. So we talked to all of them. Well, yeah, they're all studying it. They're using electric vehicles. They're using autonomous vehicles. They're using robots. They're using drones to test how we could deliver packages. So, and, and the Uber thing was still alive, but it was further down the road. It was not going to happen for another seven to 10 years and still probably won't. So we've kind of backed up and said, let's position Alliance to be the center for mobility innovation. And let's focus on freight since that's what we know and we have users who are in the business and we don't have to build an incubator because we've got the biggest companies in the world who are involved in transportation. Let's marshal them 
and get them to help us bring the technology and entrepreneurial folks to the table. So that's, that's what started all. We put a brand on it called the Alliance Texas Mobility Innovation Zone. We started getting out there and selling and talking to companies and it started working. And this was maybe 18 months ago. So fast track to today, we now have the five largest truck, autonomous truck um, companies. Not, this is not, but you, you, we, we can touch on Rivian. Maddie may want to mention something about it, but it's not that. This is the big rig trucks, the class A trucks that are moving big container loads up and down, both on a last mile basis and on a long haul basis. As we now have the top, the five leaders in that space all have set up operations at Alliance. Um, and we're working on with the top drone uh, manufacturers right now to also test and execute package delivery with drones. So it's really, it's really going. What's gonna slow us down are um, challenges that I'll, I'll touch on in a minute, but what's exciting us are the, the economics. I mean, this, think about the fact that in 2030, if these numbers are right, 30% of all, of all truck movements, all freight truck movements will be autonomous. I mean, that's, that's incredible acceleration. Um, and we believe it can happen. There, there's huge growth in efficiencies. Everybody searches. So when we, when we hit COVID, y'all saw the shutdown. So the world shuts down, supply chain gaps exposed, can't get anything, Asia can't get in here. We can't even move products across our own country. Well, all that did was accelerate this space. So now everybody is pushing as fast as they can to get autonomous freight delivery improved faster because computers don't get um, COVID. And truck drivers can't drive 24 seven, but a computer can drive a truck 24 seven. So if you think about the efficiencies that can be created over time, if we can figure out how to move freight faster, that's, that's what we're excited about. And, and the industry is validating that. The companies we're working with now are actually, are speeding to market. So we, we won't get it done without the public sector's uh, involvement. The regulatory piece is huge. Whether you're talking about creating airspace for drones to deliver a package, or whether you're talking about moving a truck from Fort Worth to Austin down I-35 um, autonomously, the regulators are going to have to approve that. So we've got to bring the regulators to the table and that's what we're doing at the Mobility Innovation Zone is we're, we're trying to create a place to convene all of, all, all of the players. And so William knows this because we're working together on a, the establishment of a new truck port where we've been able to identify almost $6 million of funding, federal public funding, uh, thanks to Michael Morris and COG and the City of Fort Worth sponsorship. And we're gonna put that money in the ground and build a fully automated truck port where these automated trucks basically come and do their transferring from the, the middle mile or the last mile to the long haul and vice versa. Uh, and it'll all be, it'll all be data capture and uh, heavy power for charging systems, but it'll begin to show how this stuff can work and then the regulators be able to see it. So pretty exciting. Infrastructure development, also huge. Everything from 5G, you gotta have 5G to run all this technology. The, the data transfer from these trucks is, is mind boggling. I, I can't even quote the number of bits per millisecond that are coming off of these trucks because they're filled with cameras and sensors and LIDAR and everything else that you can imagine uh, to stay you know, in line on the road and read everything that's happening. So you got a huge broadband capacity in our, in our systems, in our, road, our traditional infrastructure, and you gotta be able to scale. So you gotta create an environment where people can, can scale. And then the interoperative, interoperative operability is what I talked about, bringing all these systems together in a, in a, connected, in a connected way. So lots of, uh, lots of work to do. I'm gonna just quickly finish. Um, these are the different, 
we, we can basically create any use case you want. You want to move a package by drone from a, from a fulfillment, from an Amazon fulfillment center to a neighborhood, we can do it. You want to take a package uh, in an autonomous truck from the Burlington Northern Santa Fe Intermodal to the FedEx hub, we can do it. Uh, you want to pick up something with an autonomous truck at a, at a retailer, Best, Best Buy at Alliance Town Center, and take it into a neighborhood or bring it up to a distribution center for re, we can create that. So we really, back to the, the why we're doing this, we, no one else in the country has, a, has 27,000 acres. It's basically a real live, real world laboratory. Um, so these are the things we have to work with. Roadway systems, you know, without air, we control the airspace, so that makes it great for the drone folks to be able to operate. Um, these are our partners. I talked about, you know, this, this slide was almost blank a year ago, and now we have truly all these partners coming to the table, and there are several others that I can't even mention because of confidentiality agreements, but we really are beginning to get some traction and some credibility by the industry being looking at us as a true center for testing development and more importantly commercialization because that's what it's really all about. Um, I talked about what we had to work with. Uh, it, that, that freight hub is don't underestimate the power of it going forward. We also have a flight test center that we built as a basically a miniature airport so now we can allow these aircraft and drone folks to come test in a very controlled environment and they don't have to go to the Mojave Desert or the Choctaw Indian Reservation to do it. They can do it in an urban environment. Um, so that's, I wanted to leave three minutes or so for any questions, but it, I, I think the, the, the closing message, and, and I think Maddie would agree with this because of what we're seeing as a region and as a city, we, we've got an opportunity. We can be the Silicon Valley of, of mobility innovation and the future of transportation because the roots are here. I mean, you got Lockheed, you got Bell, you've got huge, that, so the engineering talent, I'll, I'll digress for 30 seconds. Um, two of the leaders in this EV tall space are, have bias towards our two biggest aerospace companies. One is biased towards Lockheed and the technology in the F-35. So they put a team of 10 Lockheed engineers together to develop their aircraft and they may move here. They already have 10 people in the, in the city of Fort Worth, which I just found out a week ago. They don't have an office. I'm trying to build one for them. Um, and they're working, they're still working remotely. And then Bell, the other company, which is also a leader, and both of these companies have SPAC'd, by the way, so they've got capital behind them, or at least they, you know, for a while they do. Um, the other one has a Bell bias. So they've hired 10 or more, no, 30 uh, former Bell engineers who are helping them develop their technology. So the, the, the expertise, the roots are here. We just need to, we gotta go grab it and and tell our story and get these early adopters here and up and running and the growth will be will be incredible. So um okay, I left one minute. Any yes, yeah Bob. Never happened. Never happened. Um, it would have, it, we, you know, Bell, the V-22 factory was in play at that time. And that was the whole, we designed around that. They were going to be bringing parts in by rail, parts in by air, taxi in, put them all in the factory, build a V-22, test it at Alliance, fly it away. That was, that was the, never happened. But don't, not think that a huge number of those parts that are now flying in Amazon, FedEx, et cetera, and coming in on the BNSF aren't ending up in a manufacturing warehouse nearby. It's just not right on the airfield. 
So, Norman. No, but I, over we we chased that South American market for a long time, and Miami dominates that that flow because it's a great transfer point for stuff going on to Europe or being fed back into the U.S. I think we'll get some of that at some point in time. We're already getting Mexico uh, automotive parts coming back and forth uh, from Mexico. Um, the European market is just, I think it all comes down to volumes. The Asian marketplace is still the, for us as a, as a consuming market is still the dominant uh, player. So that's why the, all that focus is there. But I mean, ultimately we, we have the capability of serving the globe from Alliance. So I'm hoping we, we grow it. Yes, sir. I mean, I have lots of thoughts. I, I don't have time to. <laughs> I don't have time to, to articulate them. I, I I would just say this. I think we need, you know, we need to have a greater sense of urgency in this state than we appear to be having. I mean, there's some positive. I thought Governor Abbott sort of um, eight point directive that he came out with back in June, I guess it was, was the first time I'd seen on paper a real roadmap and a cohesive business plan, but it's all in the execution. And I, I don't think we're moving fast enough. You know, thank the Lord that we're almost halfway into August and we haven't had rolling blackouts yet. That would have been terrible. Um, but we've got, we got a lot, of, so you got to fix it. You got to fix infrastructure, you got to fix the economic, underlying economics of it. I mean, I learned from a, a man who's in the energy sector and one of the leaders that the reason, I said, why can't we get more natural gas power plants permitted and built in the state of Texas with all these resources? He said, because Mike, relative to power, I mean, relative to solar and wind, natural gas power generation is $10 per kilowatt hour out of the money to attract the capital it needs to build it. So it's, it's not all about environmental and permitting. It's about return on investment. And until we shift back, you know, Randy Galloway, great sports writer, used to have a great term, overreaction Monday. It was after the Cowboys lost, you'd have all the armchair quarterbacks. Well, I think when when renewable energy became a thing, this our whole state shifted its policies and focus and underwriting um, incentives towards renewable, and we slapped way too hard to the right. And now we gotta we gotta pull it back. You've gotta have we we this state is positioned to be the most robust power generating state in the area in the world. And we, we just flipped. I mean, it's just bad, it's bad policy. And uh, we got to get it back to a blended sort of economic structure where we're using all of our resources and doing it in a wise way. Uh, but we gotta, we gotta be much more aggressive about it because we're growing too fast to support. We can't, we can't power up everything that we're, we got to power up if we want to keep growing. So it's, it's got to go fast. It's a, it, and it's a 10 year, we can't just like fix it next year. It's like 10 years of infrastructure build. Okay. I, I got, I got to go. Thank you. Thanks very much. Sorry, I went over. Oh, no, it's okay. It was a fascinating discussion. Um, okay, so a few quick announcements here as we close. Um, we do have virtual and in-person. Um, oh, we want to thank our sponsors again. Bank of Texas, thank you. Mark Nerden, Frost Bank, Frank Shields, thank you very much for your sponsorship today. We do have sponsorships available. Contact Mark Moore if you would like to sponsor a meeting. 
Don't forget to go to the website and sign up for our next social event. It will be a happy hour at the Flatiron Building. Go online and sign up for that. And we have our clay shoot coming up October 1st. And then signups are also going on for the regatta, the whatever floats your boat. See Tim Halden for sign up there. And then next week's program is Dr. Kent Scribner, Fort Worth ISD. And with that, we are adjourned.